So when I was a kid, uh, my dad said to me, Rupert, you eat with as much elegance and etiquette as a pterodactyl picking away at the remains of a prehistoric kitten. <laughs> Not only is it uncouth, it is rather disturbing. Now, it may seem just very British to have this emphasis on etiquette, but his advice to me, the only child, became more regular than a four-truck man's bowel movements. On a, on a meal-to-meal basis, he would remind me to stop lip-smacking and talking with your mouth full, watch the angle of your cutlery, don't slurp your tea. I wasn't even allowed to lick the film on the back of a yogurt, even though everyone knows from Alaska to Hong Kong, going west to east, that that bit of yogurt <laughs> is the fucking best. <laughs> and then from the age of like seven onwards, I was encouraged to sing for my supper, find titillating conversation topics for the group to enjoy, read some alt weeklies, check out the times, and then chat about apartheid in South Africa, a National Gallery exhibit, or my favorite, the French. <laughs> but I did have one thing on my side, which was that I wasn't particularly fussy. You see, my, my, dad, was trying to make, was, my dad was making noble overtures to introduce me to world cuisine, but my palate was more that of the baby boomer than millennial generation. You see, I preferred English cheese, not that gooey, smelly French stuff. Tinned fish and raw meat, uh, raw t tinned fish and corned beef, not not fresh trout or wild boar ragu, and potatoes, not golden beets. But, um, you know, from in the primary school years, 8 to 13, I, I, I was obviously aware of this emphasis of my dad, so I, I based who to invite over on their etiquette, and I'd be scouting out people in the, in the dining hall thinking, hmm, Alex is slurping spoonfuls of vinegar into his mouth, which is rather weird. Daniel is lip-smacking his way through a concoction of strawberry yogurt and baked beans and then throwing his cheese slices at me. So, no. And then, through the, I just saw it through the mist, there's Sean. Demure, elegant Sean. Perfect angle of cutlery, wondrous topics of conversation. He must be the one. I'd heard that he was a hit with parents, but now I could really see it. So I invited him over, not because we had anything in common, but because his etiquette was textbook. I mean, he came over for dinner, and afterwards I checked him and I said, Hey, Dad, what do you think? Pretty, pretty polite guy. And he said, Yes, well, he knows how to hold his knife and fork, and he's a silent chewer of food. <laughs> the thing was, it didn't take much interaction between Sean and I for me to realize that he was a bit of a shit. <laughs> uh, even, even at the age of 10. And so... I, I started to think, you know, is, is manners the best foundation for friendship? Um, anyway, things came to a head during a family holiday in Malaysia in 1999. Rupert, your lip smacking is getting simply too much, and your initiation of dinner party conversation is reaching egregiously low levels. Now, please, darling, share with the group your opinions on new labor. We were in the Japanese teppanyaki place in the hotel, and I wasn't really taken with the whole sushi thing, and actually, by this point, my diarrhea on the trip was becoming more incessant. Now, I take the blame. It wasn't my finest hour when we made a little trip to a local tropical island, and I had Trump for a full English breakfast rather than one of the local offerings, duly leading to what a British 10-year-old calls a runny bottom. But we were in the restaurant, and my dad's saying, darling, why don't you try some of this lovely raw fish? Mmm, perfectly nice. Uh, at this point, the sushi chef himself proudly interjected and said, normally it'd take a one year to train a sushi chef, but I did in three months. Uh, I just thought, yeah, listen, listen, mate. Um, the only way I'm going to eat your fish is if you cook it and can it and take me back to my wondrous 50s heyday. So after dinner, my dad, my stepmother and I, we met in the lobby bar to strike a deal. Your attitude towards global gastronomy and your overall table et etiquette is reaching all-time lows. It felt like I was the CEO of this company that made etiquette. <laughs> and, my, and my dad and stepmother were these founding board members. Either you change your ways or, or you're just going to have to dance with your stepmother tonight. Wait, what? Dancing? I don't know the first thing about dancing. I... I go to an all boys school. We throw stuff, kick things, and suppress eccentricities. 
Okay. I mean, surely no pocket money for a week would have been fairer, Dad. Anyway, this proposed dance would take place in the lobby bar after dinner. Uh, when a Shania Twain tribute band would strike up. Uh, and this was 1999, let remind you, so she was massive. Uh, the thing was, this, this, even I realized this. <laughs> the band never played, and we all know there's two categories here, they never played the good Twain of like, man, I feel like a woman, that don't impress me much, don't be stupid, you know I love you. Uh, no, it's always the real crap dog shit Twain, like... Um, uh, still the one, come on over. And yeah, and, and people would pack out the lobby to see this band play, which made it more, the whole idea, more petrifying. So I head back to the room to get ready for dinner, and that night I was determined to dazzle. I, I wore my lucky socks, and at the table I, I chose very easy to eat food, breadsticks. And I snapped off tiny little bits and kind of thought, well, am I going to be able to dance just having breadsticks for dinner? While also... Eyeballing, eyeballing my dad and, and stepmother across the table, uh, over-exaggerating my silent shoes. <laughs> I think I saw a little bit of tonsil there, Rupert. Looking forward to the dance later, my dad said, trying to cheekily induce a slip-up. But I didn't slip up. And I looked across the table in victory and smiled. I had won. Yes! No dancing! So I, you know, walked back to the room in victory, feeling pretty happy about it, and did the usual 10-year-old child routine of mandatory urination, terrible effort at toothbrushing, and then about five pages of Roald Dahl's The Twits. <laughs> I was sitting there, reading about the sixth page of The Twits, and I could hear the Twain band start in the bar, and the, the hordes of the Twain gang go and watch them. And um, it didn't take long for me to think, you know what, balls to this... I don't even like the twits. You know, it's no BFG. It's no Matilda. <laughs> Certainly no James and Giant Peach. Um, I'm somewhat high or whatever I'm feeling on carbs. So maybe I, maybe I do go for a boogie. And that way I can prove to myself that I'm not just a well-mannered, but I'm a nimble pterodactyl. <laughs> so I head to the bar and have a bit of a boogie with the Twain Gang. And it's pretty fun. I mean... The band had run out of shit Twain to play and had, run on, had, and had moved on to some Cheryl Crow. So that was fine. But being 10 years old and having had bread for dinner and unable to keep up with the margarita consumption of the group, I made a swift Irish goodbye and headed back to the room to sleep and also, mor and, and also caress my morbidly obese Peter Rabbit teddy bear. And reflecting on the day's events, it felt pretty good to know that for one meal, my dad could say, hmm, perhaps my son is capable of not eating like a pterodactyl. And I resigned to keep those sort of dinosaur tendencies at bay around him. Uh, but also to try and find, desperately, some more fun, kooky playmates. Thank you. Let's go, girls. <laughs>